Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Morning, 10 o'clock. How you doing? Uh, I get the privilege of continuing on a little bit with this series, If Not You, Then Who? And of course, it's talking about engaging in the things of God, about uh, being a soul winner, uh, just about being part of God's plan. I uh, have a long history with, uh, I got saved in April of 84. Uh, I had kind of a powerful encounter coming into the kingdom. I knew God was real. I was excited about it. I had a hunger and a passion for the word of God. And uh, I got involved in, in ministry at some level and was always doing something. And uh, a lot of my friends kind of had the same testimony that when they, that their life was really a mess. I mean, I didn't get saved till I was 30. And uh, I moved away from home when I was 18. So from 18 to 30 was the craziest, most disobedient, uh, health-filled time of my life. And it created a lot of strongholds. And, you know, I resisted coming to God and ran from him. But everybody hits the wall sooner or later, right? And so when I hit the wall, it's like, oh, okay, tell me about this Jesus thing again. How does it work? Because life's not working for me. I recognized I couldn't do it on my own. So uh, I gave my life to the Lord. And probably eight out of ten things that were really destroying my life were just eliminated. Uh, you know, I've heard people who just had addictions for years and then they gave their life to Jesus and bang, it's over, right? But my experience was eight out of ten things were over, but two things still had me by the throat. And I'm like, Lord, I'm a Christian. What's going on? You should be uh, completely delivering me. Uh, but God began to show me things in the Word. And one of the things that I saw was... Uh, when the children of Israel were going into their promised land, God promised that every opposition, every king that would come against them, that he would take care of them. If they would trust him, those kings would be defeated in battle. So it says that he drove out their enemies from before them so they could enter in their promised land. But then there's a little clause in there that says, but he didn't drive all their enemies out. He left a few of them in because they had been living uh, as dependents uh, in the wilderness and God met their every need in the generation of war the soldiers that came out of Egypt all died and nobody knew how to make war so God says how am I going to teach you to be strong and warrior like if you don't have any opposition so I realized that God still left a couple things in my life because the Bible says he teaches our hands to make war and our fingers to fight right God doesn't want us just to be a bunch of dependent wimps that die and go to heaven. He wants us to live victorious this life, being strong in him and in the power of his might, and being warriors. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to heaven and see all these guys like David and, and Caleb, and they're covered in scars and everything. I got this in this campaign. I got this in this campaign. And I'm up there going, I got splinter once, you know. <laughs> I want to be able to say, I, mean, I was in the game too, don't you? So I had some things that I was dealing with, but it just seems like I was pushing all the buttons and levers and I had the good confessions, you know. I was like in a word of faith church at the time and we were taught, man, you know, there's power in your words. And it's true, none of it was false. It just didn't seem like it was the, the big picture for me in that time. So I heard one brother was ministering who was in ministry who I respected at the time. And he said that he had some things like that that he needed to deal with. And he said, man, i got to have it out with God. These things are going to destroy my ministry. So he decided to fast and pray. He got in his motor home. He went up to the top of the mountain and didn't come down until he got his answers. So I thought, well, i got to do that, right? Because nothing's going to change unless I get busy. So I decided to go on a seven-day water fast. Which for me at the time, or even today, but for me at the time, it was like crazy to even think that. And, uh, 
But I wanted to go, uh, show God, look, I'm, I'm in business, right? And this is the only way that I can display that. But you, you got to talk because if this doesn't work, I don't know where I'm going from here, you know. So uh, I like to get out from underneath the warfare. I mean, there's so much stuff going on over, over the valleys that uh, I just fasted. And I would go out and, and, and drive down a dirt road in the desert and get away from all the stuff and where it was really quiet. And you could scream and nobody could hear you, you know. And so I'm praying out there and it was my last day. And I said, Lord, I'm eating tonight. So if you got anything to say, today's your day. Right. You know, I mean, you don't really get away with giving God ultimatums, but you get irritated, you know, so you, you want a response. So I'm out there praying and thinking, God, you got to talk to me. I got to have answers. And, uh, you know, I was waiting for the fire and the whirlwind and all of this. And I got the still small voice. And uh, I figured, you know, seven days, I should have some sort of spinning wheel Ezekiel encounter or something because I paid for it, you know. And I got a still small voice. And to me, it was such an understatement that I'm like, that's it. You know, I'm having two steaks tonight. You know, I just, I want, but he said to me, and this, this ends up being quite profound and is going to be the basis of my message now. But he said, he said, son, get in the game. I'm like, what? Get in the game. What does that mean? Right? So. You know, one thing I've learned is that there's all kind. you know, you've got natural thoughts, you've got the enemy's voice, you've got God's voice, and sometimes they run together and it just seems confusing. And I said, Lord, if this is you, and this is a wisdom nugget, Lord, if this is you, I want you to take what you just said and I want you to show me and confirm it in the word of God so that I know that it's you. The Bible challenges to test or try the spirits of God to make sure that they're of him, right? And you go to the word. So I go to the word. When I got home, and it was the most amazing thing, I realized that when God said, get in the game, he was trying to show me a principle. And when I went into the word, I couldn't go anywhere in the word where the principle didn't jump off the page. And it's what I'd like to call the Isaiah 58 principle. Now, anybody that's ever fasted and wants to do it biblically has always gone over to Isaiah 58 to study because God starts out with, this is the fast that I have chosen. And he goes on to talk about that fast with well, the Isaiah 58 principle. If we can put Isaiah 58 up, thank you. I'll read it from mine. It might be a little different because I'm an old King James guy, right? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? This is God speaking. To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Well, the first question I asked God when I was reading that is, whose yoke are we talking about? Is this... Is this me fasting to get an anointing to lay hands on somebody so that I can have power to break their yoke? Or is this me fasting to get this junk off my life and break the yoke that seems to be controlling me, even though I'm supposed to be a Christian? See, I didn't want to go forward in ministry. I believed I was called in ministry, but I thought if I went forward and talked about God's freedom, I'd be a hypocrite because I'm not really totally free right now. Anybody ever feel that way? How can I go share my faith with somebody when I still got baggage, right? I'm going to show you something awesome. When I asked the question to the Lord, whose yoke is we talking about? He said both. And then I realized that if, if you need healing in your body, the best thing you can do is go find somebody that's sick and lay your hands on them. Because what it does is it places a demand on the anointing for healing. And in order for it to get to them, it's got to go through you. So... Your healing is tied to yielding to the call of God to minister to people that need healing, if that's the particular area. I'm going to show it to you in the Isaiah 58 principle. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, that you bring the poor that are cast out to your house when you see the naked, that you cover them, that you hide not thyself from thy own flesh? It means you don't turn your back on your family. Right, even though they're irritating sometimes and just say, well, I'll let God deal with them. I'll just go to, you know, Mexico on an outreach and minister to other people's family. No, if your family has needs. You have an obligation. You're supposed to be involved with them. Don't turn your back on your own flesh. It says if you do these things, a lot of people say, well, you know, you got to bear fruit and fruit is winning souls. Well, absolutely. Fruit is winning souls, but it's not the only way to bear fruit. Notice it says ministering to the poor, right? 
uh, stretching out your hands to the afflicted, laying hands on the sick. All these things uh, pull the anointing of God into the experience for them and you to take advantage of. Listen, here's the Isaiah 58 principle distilled down. As you stretch forth your hand to the afflicted, then your light breaks forth. It didn't say their light, right? So in the Isaiah 58 principle is if we're not in the game, giving God the opportunity to flow through us, then we're still in obscurity. We're still in confusion. We still have uh, opportunities to be angry, to get sick, to be unforgiving. And we need to find some assignment from God and engage because our life is in the engagement. You understand? Okay. I'm going to read some more scriptures. Uh, Daniel 12, 3 says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They that turn many to righteousness as the stars of heaven. So there's a wisdom key in the Isaiah 58 principle that as you minister to people, basically they're living for the devil, and you minister to them and you turn them towards faith for faith in Christ for righteousness. You're turning people to righteousness, right? The gospel is, is the righteousness of God as a gift revealed. When you're sharing that, there's always an anointing on the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. So if you share your faith, you draw the power of God, right? Now, the early church was excited. Man, they ran headlong into persecution. And when they got slapped around and beaten, they rejoiced. They counted it uh, a privilege to suffer for Jesus. Today, in the, the American church, 90% of the Christian church, the professed Christian church, has never personally led anybody to Jesus. That means 10% of the Christian church is doing all the salvation work. That's a little scary, but I don't blame Christians. I blame teachers. I blame myself, right? Because obviously Jesus shared something with the disciples that so inspired them that they ran headlong into the battle of winning souls for Christ. So we teachers, pastors have to share in the responsibility of failing to motivate the church to see the hidden Isaiah 58 principle and real, realize if I'm not in the game, I'm my own worst enemy. Does that make sense? Okay. So let me tell you a story. Back in that period of time, when God gave me this revelation and the word began to open up to me, uh, the church that I was attending uh, was putting together a missionary team to go to the Philippines. And uh, they had the A team already picked out and they were ready to go. And I wasn't on it and I was okay with that. Um, but I knew the lady that put the whole campaign together. She rallied all of these pastors together in the Philippines. Uh, there were going to be like four crusades that happened in different cities. And it was going to be a big deal. And uh, right when we were ab they were about to leave to go on the missions trip, some of you may remember there were a couple of missionaries, I believe, from Kansas that were captured by Muslim insurgents or something, and they ended up being killed. And our senior pastor, you know, got nervous and said, you know, I don't want to send a team over there into that kind of environment because I'm a shepherd. I want to make sure that nothing happens to you. So he, he pulled his, the team out. Well, I appreciate that he had some concern for the missionaries, but... He, the, the lady that set everything up now was left hanging because she had set up all these crusades. So she went around, tried to build her own team, and she wasn't very discriminant in her desire to do that because she just needed to have bodies over there in a couple of weeks. So, hey, want to go Philippines? Right? And it's like, mm. But I was a little bit indignant that some people who said they were going to go that, and activated her plan and then decided not to go. I, I felt that was wrong, and I said, well, I've never done missionary work before, but this is wrong. I'm going, you know. And a bunch of people jumped in, and so we were the B team. We weren't the A team. But in the end of the trip, we decided we were God's team. We were the right team. God had a plan because it was amazing when we went over there. Uh, but because uh, this woman was 
uh, who headed up this thing, was a little bit indiscriminate in the way she put the team together because of her desperation. Uh, I went on this trip with some people I didn't even know, never even met, you know. And so we're here we go. And it's like, hi, you know, I'm Tim. And uh, so we're going over there, and there's one woman named Ava, and I never met her before. And she was very quiet, very mild, very sweet. Uh, you could feel, you know, she loved the Lord. The presence of God was on her. Uh, and it was her night to do the crusade, and she goes up to do the crusade, and she went from this little, hi, how are you, to boom, when she started ministering. And I'm like, whoa, you know, what's inside this girl, right? And she gave a testimony that changed my life and confirmed something that God was dealing with me about. She said, I want to share with you my testimony. She said, you know, I've been a Christian a number of years, and, uh, but I went through a very painful, painful divorce and uh, because of it, I got bitter and unforgiving, and I was struggling. And over a pro protracted period of time, I found out that I had got cancer. I went to the doctor, and the doctor told me I had stage four bone cancer and that I had six months to live and that I should set my affairs in order. And she said, I was devastated, right? And so she said, you know, this on top of my divorce and everything, and it's like, I can't believe it. So she got to the part where it started to get very painful, and she was crying out in her pain. And she said, Lord, you've got to heal me. I know you're a healing God. You've got to heal me. And the pain would hit her and say, oh, Lord, you've got to heal me. And, and she went on and on with this for quite some time. And then finally the Lord spoke. But he said something to her that was as crazy as what he spoke to me. He said, he said, Ava, go preach my gospel. And she's like, Hello, stage four bone cancer. And uh, so the next day she woke up and she's in pain. She's crying out, God, you've got to heal me, Ava. Go preach my gospel. She's like angry, right? And so the next day the pain is worse and go preach my gospel. Finally, she gets this revelation. He's not, he's not going to say anything else, right? This is... <laughs> This is Dr. Jesus' prescription for my situation here, and I don't like this prescription. But guess what? I mean, you got six months to live. You're about ready to do anything that the Lord says to do. She scrapes herself together. She goes out. She hands out a few tracks. She exhausts herself. She comes to him. She falls asleep. She wakes up the next day. She still doesn't feel well, but she feels better. So she keeps praying, said, Lord, you got to heal me. He said, hey, look, go preach my gospel right? She gets up, she goes down a Hollywood and vine, and literally, I mean, this is not a metaphor, she gets a soapbox, and she stands on it with an open Bible, and she's just preaching the gospel to everybody that's walking by. Some people stop, some people jeer, right? But she just obeys God. Each day that she does it, she felt a little better, right? Finally, she got so caught up in God's assignment that she started to uh, get invited to go into women's prisons, and she was teaching women how to get free from bitterness and to forgive and, and uh, that God still loved them. He still had a great plan for their life and everything. And the anointing of God was on it. People were getting saved. And it, it became so powerful and so all-encompassing that she forgot that she was even sick for a time. And she was coming right up on the sixth month. And her friend, who was so concerned for her, said, Ava, it's like almost six months. And, you know, I really think you need to go to the doctor and... You know, and, and get an update, right? So she's oh, yeah, huh, okay. She goes to the doctor, they x-ray. Now, this was stage four bone cancer. The doctors are like, I don't get it. You know, there's no trace of cancer in your body. You're completely healed, right? <laughs> now, I know that we shouldn't be motivated to serve the Lord by fear, we should just be out of our gratitude and out of the hunger and the desire for God's presence and anointing in our life. But she became a missionary and went all over and went to China. And I said, Ava, you're so aggressive. I said, how come you're like all over the map? She said, I'm afraid to stop. Right. You know, because she recognized that her life was inextricably tied to the calling and the purpose that God had given her. And this is really is true for all of us. We need to come to a place where we define who we are and step into the flow of God's calling. Uh, I shared a little bit at the eight, a kind of a cute story. Some of you that may have heard me minister before, I talked a little bit about 
uh, not being big fan of cartoons, but uh, had a little surprise daughter that came into my life that, you know, a lot of times I have to babysit. And uh, Netflix is like the best babysitter ever. You know, all you got to do is just kind of sit there and make sure they don't hurt themselves while they watch TV. And uh, so for a while, I like resisted watching these childish cartoons, but they pull you in. And, and so I, I, I talked a little bit about Sophia and the princess test and everything and made an analogy. But here I'm watching uh, Finding Nemo with my daughter. And... Uh, there's a part in there where they, that they need to get to a place like very quickly, but it's too far and they're not going to make it on time. And somebody gives them the, this revelation that, hey, well, why don't you go over and get into the Gulf Stream and the Gulf Stream will accelerate the process of your journey and you can get to where you need to go in extremely fast amount of time with hardly any effort whatsoever. And so then they're walking this thing out, and I'm thinking, and I'm looking at this thing, and the Lord is like going, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he's trying to get something over to me. He said, look, everybody has a calling and a purpose that's on their life. And when you, when you function outside of the calling and the purpose, it's like walking uphill all the time, right? But once you find out who you are and what you are called to do, and you step into the flow and the calling of God, it's like being in the Gulf Stream. And everything you do becomes easy because you're yoking up with the Lord's purpose. And, you know, if you yoke up with Jesus, then he does all the, he knows the direction you're supposed to go. And he also does all the pulling. And you're just kind of going along for the ride and getting all the benefits of his work, Right. But you still must yoke up and partner with his purpose, right? So I realized, man, I've spent most of my life feeling like I've been driving around with the handbrake on in my car, thinking that's what normal feels like. When I stepped into what God was calling me to do, it was like, did you know that this is supposed to go down? And then all of a sudden, you go, this? is what the abundant life feels like, right? Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He didn't say you would. He said you might, you know. In other words, he's got some things that he wants you to do, and you're, you're invited to step into the abundance. Or you're free not to step into the abundance and keep driving around with a handbrake on, trying to tough your way through life. Jesus prayed, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth. Our job is to try to pull the kingdom down. We keep wanting to trudge through life and say, oh, dear Jesus, come quickly so we can get into that heavenly experience. God says, no, I want you to pull the heavenly experience down into your life. And I want that experience to flow into everybody else's life around you. That's the whole point of getting involved with God. So the whole Ava thing rocked my world. And then God began to show me uh, other testimonies and other stories. I didn't share this today, but I'll, I'll go there. Some of you may not, some of you weren't even born when TVN was on, uh, Christian television, but uh, I certainly was. I, I've been around a long time. Back in the day, um, we would go to church and everything, but there was this kind of new deal that was coming on where they had built radio stations and TV stations. All of them, Paul and John Crouch uh, created Christian television, and we could sit at home and, and a lot of shut-in people and, and, and people that couldn't get to church, didn't have cars. They could have church at home. And, you know, they had so many different people on. Not everybody was your cup of tea, and not everybody was really excited about some of the characters that were on there, but they were responsible probably for millions of souls coming into the kingdom. So uh, for however you may feel about Christian television uh, and, and the people that were involved in that, I would like to enter into their reward because they have great rewards with the Lord for being obedient to what he called them to do. So here's Jan Crouch. She's like, you know, co-sponsoring this mega TV station. And, uh, of course, you know, you do that, you make the enemy mad. And she got attacked, and she fell for whatever reason. I don't know the details, but she fell into a season of very, very dark depression. 
And uh, we're talking the kind of depression where you can't do anything. I mean, you, you stay in bed. And, uh, you know, you can't, you can't get up and cook for your family. You can't comb your hair. I mean, you, you're just like, take me home Jesus kind of place. Uh, some of you may have experienced some of that. Um, so she's in this situation. And, of course, they knew everybody who was anybody. So the best of the best were praying. Uh, laying hands on her, rebuking the devil, doing all of the stuff that we are accustomed to doing in order to set somebody free. And yet she stayed uh, in this stronghold for some time. And if I recall, and I'm pulling this up from a long time ago, uh, it lasted like six months. And finally, uh, Paul got angry, her husband, and said, okay, it's over. We're done. He said, you know, get out of bed. We're going to church. He said, no, I'm not going to church. He said, you are going to church. If I have to drag you there, you're going to church, right? She said, no, no, I can't. I can't do my hair, my makeup. He said, I don't care about none of that. I'm going to drag your body into church, and we're going we're gonna to believe God. And so she negotiated with him, and if I remember the story properly, they cut a deal. Okay, but we'll come late, right, after worship's over and everything, so, and we'll sit in the back. Nobody will see me. And then we leave before the service is over so I don't have to engage with anybody. And he goes, all right, we'll start there, right? So as the story goes, they sneak in the back, and they're sitting in the back, and I think she's still, you know, like in her pajamas, and, you know, her hair's all messed up and everything, and nobody wants to go to church like that, you know? And uh, she's just looking at her watch, making sure they get out on time. And uh, there's an evangelist up there preaching with power about the love of God and everything, and some person, very broken, possibly homeless, runs up, falls uh, at the feet of the, of the speaker and just starts crying and, and wailing. And, uh, he, and, and apparently the speaker just ignores her and just keeps preaching like she doesn't exist. And Jan is looking at that going, really? That's not right. All right. And so she's looking around at the other people in the congregation. Where's the prayer team? Where's the connect team? Where, where is everybody? Well, you know, this woman is just like crying for somebody to be involved. And nobody's getting involved. So finally, she gets mad. She says, the Lord, you got to raise somebody up to go over there and minister to her. And the Lord says, how about you? <laughs> she said, no, not going to happen, Lord. Look at me. I am not going like this to the front. It is just not going to happen. So this woman starts, ah, starts wailing even louder. And Jan starts getting even more indignant, saying, now, Lord, no, really. No, really. This ain't right. Somebody, you've got to raise somebody up, and they got to go over there, and they got to minister to her because this is not Jesus. How about you? No, Lord, we already had that conversation. I am not going up there. And then so it happened one more time, and then Jan gets the same revelation that Ava got. He ain't going to let anybody go up there. I'm the only one that he is choosing for this assignment, and I don't want it. But my compassion for what she's dealing with trumps my own challenges and compels me to go forward on her behalf. She goes up. She throws her arms around this girl in front of everybody. And, of course, everybody recognizes her, you know. And she doesn't care. What she cares about in that moment is that person. And she begins to love on and pray for that person. And the power of God falls and sets everybody free. And Jan got up from that experience completely free from depression. And it never came back. She got in the game, right? The reality of it is, is that God has invited us into his presence through the activation principle, through the Isaiah 58 principle. But we halt because we've got stuff in our life and we think it would be hypocritical to go forward and get involved in somebody's life because maybe the thing they're crying out for, we got more junk than they do, right? But the key is, is that when you go forward in the anointing of God or you go forward and you, you step out in faith, the glory of God falls on the purposes of God. And it's deliverance for the teller and the told not just the person that you're ministering to. This is why the early church rejoiced, right? And you know, there's something that I, you know, sometimes you have experiences and no, you don't hear anybody talk about, so you make up your own terminology. But I call it the rebound principle. And that basically means, and, I, and I've experienced this in healing lines, where somebody comes forward for healing, 
Um, but you can tell that they're not really convinced that God heals today or for whatever. Maybe, you know, grandma pushed, you know, Billy forward. Go get your healing. He's like, all right. <laughs> you know, let the man of God do his thing, right? His heart is not really open to receive. He doesn't have the revelation of the possibility. And, but you feel the presence of God, so you lay hands on him, and you can almost feel uh, something kind of begin to flow and bounce back, right? It's, it's the rebound principle, right? Well, you can have the rebound principle in, in sharing your faith. Say, hey, brother, I just want to talk to you about Jesus. You know, God's got a better life for you than the one that you're living right now, but he, he wants relationship and covenant with you, and I'd like to. And then he, oh, no, brother, I don't want that. I, I don't want It's okay. The anointing of God came to give him the opportunity to feel the reality of God through my testimony, and he doesn't want it, okay? So there is a kind of a kickback, a rebound principle, right? There was a blessing on that testimony for him, but he doesn't want it, but it bounces back to me, and I get the blessing, right? It's still, so, you know, we're so worried about going out and ministering and getting rejected, right? But, I mean, if you go out and... and, and Somebody receives the Lord, you, you got to split the blessing with that person. But if you get rejected, you get it all. <laughs> so let's go out and find five people to reject us and go home happy, man. <laughs> we'll get drunk on the things of God because God always falls on his purposes. Okay? Let me read you some more scriptures. I'll read you another scripture. I don't know where I'm at in time. Here's one I didn't read before, but it's good. You remember the Cain and Abel story. The Lord said to Cain, he was angry. He said, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? You know, why the long face, buddy, right? If you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do well, sin lies at the door. It's what I call the fountain principle. You know, you can't take... Uh, bacteria and garbage and push it into a flowing fountain and expect it to stay. The fountain is constantly flowing outward and so it always stays pure and clean and drinkable because it's always moving and it's always moving out. Well, Jesus said, as you minister, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Now, as long as there's the goodness of God and the ministry of God flowing out of you, nothing of the enemy can flow in you. But when you decide to halt and pull back from your assignment, you go from being living water to stagnant water, and stagnant water always breeds bacteria. So being in the game is the way of life for us, right? Now, it's up to you whatever game God has called you to be involved with. Um, you know, if, you, if you're new and you come to the church and you don't know what God's called you to do, the Bible says do whatever it is your hands find to do and do it with all your might. And then once you get involved with God uh, and you're involved somewhere and maybe you're going to usher or do something else, you'll begin to see other ministries. You'll begin to build relationships with people who are moving in the grace of God and the anointing of God. And it's like, ooh, that's interesting. You know, how come he's always happy? How come this always works out for him? How come he's prosperous? And you start rubbing elbows with people who are a little farther than you, and then you start figuring things out. You know, I use the analogy at the eight of that, the pachinko game, where you drop the balls, and they just, and they bounce all over the place. And it's like, ding, 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 no, I'm not supposed to be over here. And then you, ding, 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 ding. But eventually you'll fall down, and you'll find that little saddle where you're supposed to be. And you go, oh, well, there's my zone right there. I can feel the Gulf Stream pulling me down with ease, and that's the ministry that I'm called to do. But it takes a little experimenting, a little exercising to find out where you fit in the body. And, of course, they have the light trap ministry, and they give you the profile testings and different things. That Those are all tools that will help you try to find your place in the body. But you want to find it quick because the abundant life, right, is in that flow, right? I don't know about you, but historically, I think part of the problem uh, in the body of Christ is that we try to compel people to serve out of duty and out of obligation. And what's wrong with you? After all Jesus did for you, you should get in the game. 
I don't motivate by guilt. I'm sorry. Even if it's true, I won't do it. Just because, no, you ain't going to control me. It ain't going to happen. It's just, you know. But when God invites us into the abundant life, when he shows us the Isaiah 58 principle, man, you better get some big guys because I'm fighting my way in. I'm going to be a part of everything that God wants me to do. So the fountain principle is that if you, it didn't say if you do wickedly sins at the door. It says even by non-doing, by not doing well, right? Uh, the, you've heard this scripture, and, I, and, and I, I hesitate to use it because I don't want, again, uh, to provoke you to serve because you're afraid of consequences. I want to provoke you to serve because you see the blessings and the rewards in it. But the Bible says he that knows to do good and doesn't do it sins at the door, Right? There, there's a, a potential penalty for non-doing, but the reward eclipses the penalty, right? You begin to see what God is promising. Uh, there's a verse that says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. So you're working in the ministry, you're tied up to this thing, and you're walking around and you're grinding the corn for other people's consumption, right? Right? But you get, to be, you get to bend down and you get to partake of the corn because you're part of the work. That's an allegory. Paul said, does God, does God care for oxen or is, it, is that a parable for us? Well, it's obviously a parable for us. When you're about the Father's business and you're generating blessings for others, you get to eat also. Jesus said, my meat, my food, my substance is to do the will of the Father. When God says, taste and see that the Lord is good, he's inviting you to be part of the game so you can eat the spiritual food that comes from stretching out your hand to the afflicted so that your light breaks forth. But in order to be in position for that blessing, for the abundant life, you have to first be in covenant with God. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.